So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, server-side Swift. How does it work out as in physical fitness in the real world? Uh, wrong way. There we go. A little bit about myself. Um, I run a freelance company called Bright Digit. Um, I have. Uh, I live in the USA. I live in Michigan with my wife and my six wonderful children, and um, been doing development for. Yeah, like 25 years. I can't believe it. And um, <laughs> it's crazy. Time flies. I've been doing iOS development since 20, uh, 2010, and I've been running my own company, Bright Digit, since 20, 2012. Um, and I have a, a podcast and a YouTube channel there. You can also check out my code um, at my GitHub profile as well. So uh, today we're going to talk about, we're going to, this is going to be kind of like a workout. It's not just a presentation. So, you know, get your activity rings. Uh, this is going to be fantastic. So, uh, <laughs> we're going to start with doing a warm up, uh, just kind of learning the basis, basics of fitness and server side Swift. I'm going to teach you how uh, GB, the specific application I'm going to be talking about today that I've been working on, we're going to do some stretching. Then we're going to do a low intensity workout, which is a technical deep dive of some Swift code that I hope you find useful and helpful. Uh, and then we're going to go a little bit outside our comfort zone, folks. Um, there's other devices that people use that don't run Swift. So yeah, this is going to be really intense. So we're going to try to get your heart rate up with that. And then lastly, we'll do a cool down of future plans and lessons learned. So let's warm up everybody uh, and learn about fitness and server side Swift. So I'm going to take go back in time and way back to the year uh, 2018 and there's a conference that goes on called uh, Try Swift in New York. And I'm looking at this and I, I went to it and there's this like workshop, build a cloud native Swift app. And I'm like, okay, so first of all, Swift's fairly new. It's pretty much a iOS thing, right? Like who else is gonna use Swift? Why would it be cloud native? This is crazy. And so I go to this workshop in this IBM building in New York and I'm introduced to this little thing called Katura. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's interesting, that's cool. And then when I get home, I get a little curious and I'm looking around and I'm trying to figure out, okay, like, is there some other way of doing this? Like people talk about this thing called vapor, like what is that? And I fell in love with it. I was like, this is, this is amazing. It's super simple. Uh, it's fast when it runs, it uses all the advantages of Swift. And so I'm like thinking, what kind of app do I want to now build with this new vapor uh, server? And, you know, obviously there's like a to-do to -do list, right? Everybody wants to build a to-do list when they first get a thing. Hey, there's a Vision Pro. Let's build a to-do list for the Vision Pro so we can see our to-do list in 3D. Fantastic. You know, but like, but then I'm like, one thing I'm thinking of is I was really, in, I'm still really into the Nintendo Switch. And I'm like, I want to track all the games I have and have like a wish list. And I could pull the info for, scrape it from the Nintendo website, blah, blah, blah. But I was like, nah, that's, that's not cool enough. And then I thought to myself, how about a workout app? But how, <clears throat> why would you ever have a workout app on the server? That doesn't make any sense. Well, here's what I was thinking is, um, first of all, there's this brand new device that's $17,000 <laughs> that runs Swift. And I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. Why don't we run Swift on a giant server and at the same time run it on the smallest device possible? Of course, this is before embedded, right? But you get the idea. And I'm into like working out, get, get this, I work out and I'll have like Joy-Cons in my hand while I'm working out on elliptical. And it's like, it's like my way of getting my workout in while like playing whatever favorite video game I want to play at the same time. It's like, it's multitasking, right? This is fantastic. And two, there's this like whole community of people who do speed running. And I don't know if you noticed this, but down there in the bottom left, there's a little uh, thing right there showing the person's heart rate as they're speed running. And I'm like thinking to myself, ah, okay. What if there is a way I can live stream my heart rate in li live as I'm uh, doing something? But then like the question ends up being is how am I gonna go ahead and do this, right? Well, let's talk about how this is gonna actually work. So the way it works is your heart rate, you get health kit, right? You get your permissions all set up, et cetera, et cetera. And a heart rate comes in through health kit. And then I make a post call to the server and Vapor then takes that post call 
and it then opens a website, or sorry, excuse me, it posts that to the server. Meanwhile, you have a browser window, <clears throat> and that browser window opens a WebSocket listening for that heart rate. So then that gets communicated back to the browser through the WebSocket. And then what you do is you uh, get your fancy Mac Pro running OBS, and you go ahead and there's a, there's a list. OBS, if anybody has ever used it, is massive, super complicated. You could do pretty much everything you want, including breaking your live stream. So you go into OBS and you set up a source for uh, not a window or a, or a screen, but like you can actually set it to a browser um, URL. And you put that URL in OBS, right? So you put the URL in there. And then OBS now points to your web browser <coughs> that's showing your heart rate. And then basically what you could do is overlay that. And you can do a lot of things with OBS, like doing a green screen or anything like that. And that will live stream your web browser and your video and that's how you get your heart rate um, into your live stream using uh, our app. And um, this is where I created the app called Heart Twitch. Uh, it was a good name at the time. It's a horrible name now. I'll explain that later. But you can sign up to Heart Twitch, and um, it will. You can set up a live stream to uh, share your heart rate. And I have been using it. Uh, I was doing a lot of live streams. So see if you could see here in the upper right. Uh, this doesn't work. But in the upper right, you can see my calorie count, for instance, while I'm playing Galaxy here, right? Um, or I got really into Ring Fit. Has anybody played Ring Fit before? Okay, yeah, like Ring Fit's a blast. So I was live streaming, uh, playing Ring Fit while using Hard Twitch at the same time. And it would do like a little, this is the best I could do, by the way, for doing an activity ring in HTML and CSS. But um, I have a little activity ring showing how many calories I'm doing up to my goal. So this is fantastic. Um, and then uh, those of you who know me know I have a podcast, so I might talk about a lot of my projects. And uh, I get a call from, or an email uh, from this person on the left, Chris, and Chris is like, hey, this is a really great idea, but how about let's do something a little bit better? I don't know if you know this, but there's a pandemic going on and people aren't going to the gym. Why don't we take this heart, like, except for this poor guy, right? And, and her, like, where they're mad. They do not look happy in that photo. Um, and, and people are doing fitness at home. Like, Apple Fitness is fantastic. I use that, too, as well. And what if there's a way we could help people um, live show their heart rate, for instance, to their instructor? Or if an instructor wants to live stream their heart rate, they can do that as well. And so this is where the genesis, the idea of... Um, GB comes from is like rather than just doing it for video games, but you know, what crazy idea, but like actually doing it for fitness classes. And that's where GB comes in. So let me show you a little demo of how GB works. So you go in, you sign in, and you create an account, or you just sign in and it automatically will create an account on your web browser. You have the app installed on the watch, that's what you're seeing to the right. Then you go ahead. And you will create a new class, for instance, whatever uh, class you want. And these usually match up with workout types that come with HealthKit. So that way we, we, know, we know how to, when the user starts the class, what workout type to start on their watch. You can add a date and time. So if you want to say, like, oh, my class is only Wednesdays at 6 AM or whatever, you can do that as well. Um, for testing purposes, I didn't add that because it would restrict when I could start the class. So in this case, I don't have a class. Then I can go ahead and um, we can start the class. There it is, my new class called Mixed Cardio. And then notice on the watch, we get a nice little notification if we're the instructor that, hey, you started your class on the web. You want to go ahead and join your class on the watch. Then you go ahead and you tap that. And we have the heart rate here, and we show the heart rate on the uh, web browser as well. And if we wanted to, we could go ahead and bring that into OBS, or we could just have the instructor just look at it, kind of like I'm looking at this comfort monitor over here while they're doing their fitness class. I end the class, and then it automatically ends the class on the watch right away. So that's kind of the basics of how GBeat works and how it works with live streaming. 
let's take a little bit of a technical deep dive and look at some of the things that we built along the way that helped both with the app and the developer experience. So with Heart Twitch, I didn't want to deal with username and login. Username and login or username and password on the Apple Watch is just an awful experience. Um, and like, I don't want to have to tell Siri on the Apple Watch, it's XVZ6J ampersand, right? Um, I wanted to keep it simple. So any, anything that could reduce any like login interface on the watch is great. So what I came up with was using CloudKit because you already have the watch <coughs> linked to your CloudKit account, right? And I even built a miss kit here that you see the GitHub URL is specifically for that purpose. So that way Vapor can talk to CloudKit um, for getting any sort of information from a private database. But it, it felt kind of like not really the way to do it. So when we got to GB, we ended up uh, opting in for signing with Apple. And that was perfect. That worked out awesome. Um, there's a really great, I'll have uh, links in the end to all the GitHub packages that we use. But the, uh, Vapor, uh, the Vapor stuff and the JWT stuff with sign-in with Apple is absolutely fantastic. And so this was awesome. So now you can sign in on the watch and it's automatically connected to the account you have on the web. Great. And then you start doing watch development. Hold on. Oh yeah, there we go, good, okay. Nope, wait. Oh, crap. Yeah. Uh. That can, that can slow down development uh, quite a bit. So what's, what can we do instead? Like I do want to test the, on the actual device for sure, but not for simple code changes, right? So obviously um, we could do, we could, you know, use the simulator, ta-da, that's great, right? Simulator is gonna allow me to do a quick Apple development and then, you know, when I feel ready to test on the actual device, then I could, I could do that. Uh, but there's one big problem about this. Sign in with Apple and the watch simulator don't work. They just don't. Like, you try to sign in with Apple, it tells you you have to link an account, and then you try to link an account, and it's like, oh, well, you have to have Face ID or something to do it. It's like, it's not set up. So how the heck am I going to run this app on the simulator when I want to do quick code changes, right? Well, I got to thinking, and I was like, wait a second. I have access to the server if I'm running both the server and the simulator. I should have, be able to manipulate the simulator through my Mac, right? And so what I ended up doing was user will try to get on the simulator and nothing will happen, right? But then if they go on the website and they log in there, Vapor can then take that token that I logged in with and save it to the simulator. Because I have access to the simulator, I can get well, what the data directory is or what the temp directory is or whatever and copy that information there. And then from there, it'll automatically, um, it'll automatically enable a button to use that token to log in. So the user goes into the website, they sign in with Apple, Vapor takes that token, saves it to the simulator, and then the save <coughs> simulator, excuse me, enables that button for sign in with simulator. So here's some example of that code that I use. So, so there's this list here that you can see. And what that does is it runs um, SimCTL. If any of you are familiar with SimCTL, it's like the, the backbone of doing anything with the simulator. It runs XRun CTL to get the list of the devices in JSON format, and then it uses Codable to then decode that. It runs the process within, within Vapor, and then it grabs that JSON. That gives me a list of the devices. And then it goes through, it looks at the list of devices, finds the one that is actually booted, so every device that's booted, and then I find when I take that list of devices that are booted, and then I go ahead and run get app container, giving the app bundle to uh, GB, for instance. Um, and then what container type, in this case, I use the data container type, and then the device ID of whatever device is booted. And so the way that works is we just add in, 
further arguments um, for the get app container, which is get app container, the simulator ID, the app bundle, and then the container description, whether it's data or temp or whatever directory in the simulator you want. And then we go ahead and we save that to the simulator. Um, we grab the container pass. We give it a new name for that specific file that will just have the string of the token. And we go ahead and just write those to the simulators that are booted. And what that'll do is that'll enable the button because that watch OS is watching for that file. And once it sees that file exists, it tries to authenticate and then it enables the button. And so that's how I get around the issue of sign in with Apple on the simulator is by taking advantage of running vapor on the actual machine the simulator is on. Another, another situation, and I don't know if anybody has run into this, but like, well, let's say you're doing full stack Swift development, you're doing it in Xcode, you're doing vapor, you're doing Apple Watch, you're doing phone. Okay, but then when I'm running on the actual device, how's that device gonna know where that dev server is? That's one of the issues uh, we ran into pretty quickly. Because it, like, we could do something obvious, right? We could just go into Xcode and say, base URL is whatever the IP address of my machine is. But that could change. I could be somewhere else. Um, so this is when I came up with the idea of um, sublimation. Um, the idea of sublimation is the Swift package is giving it the ability for the phone or the watch um, to be able to find the development server within your local network. And at first, the way I did this is by running ngrok and then saving the URL. How many of you are familiar with ngrok? So ngrok is a service where you give it uh, some local address and it'll automatically, it'll create a tunnel basically to your local dev machine so that way you can have access to it. And so I would take that URL, I would save that to the cloud and with some like key that I would know. And then on the device, I would just look up the URL based on that key and bucket name, for instance. But then I thought to myself, there's gotta be a better way to do this, right? Well, I don't know if any of you know this, but there's a built-in technology called Bonjour. And that is when I decided, well, this is an even better way because it's all automatic. No configuration for the developer. They can just get this up and running without setting up buckets or keys or any of that crap. So here's an example of setting up Bonjour to do this. Uh, you set up a binding configuration. This is an object that has the list of hosts and um, has what port the server is running on, whether it's HTTPS or not. You take that information, you uh, give Bonjour that information, and then it'll advertise that um, within your network, letting them know where your server is. The way it works is we take that binding configuration. The binding config configuration, we used uh, protobuf because I wanted something really small. Protobuf is a way of encoding structs and data in binary format as opposed to JSON. It's really fantastic. You should definitely take a look. And we take that data, we encode it as a string, we split it into two, about 200 characters each, and we create a dictionary of um, that information in what you can see here in, in like sublimation underscore with the offset. And then we create a text record. Um, there's other ways of doing this. Text records were the best way because of working with the Apple Watch and the limitations of that. So then that text record is then attached to the Bonjour service when we uh, advertise it. Now on the client, um, we have a browser that goes ahead and it has a default URL configuration just to fill in any blanks that it might not know about. And then it goes ahead and every time the browser results change, it calls parse, parse results. Meanwhile, we have an async stream to get the URLs and that will just keep listening for any new URL that comes from the Bonjour service. But the parse results, you can see here, this is where we take that. We uh, only want results that are of the Bonjour type with the text record. And we take that text record and we go ahead and reparse that out into a binding configuration. And then the binding configuration has a URLs property that goes ahead and returns the URLs based on that um, list of hosts, port name and, and HTTPS. So that way we now have new URLs for the base URL. And this can be set up either with Vapor um, I even have it set up now to work with uh, life cycle, the new lifecycle service stuff. 
So this works with Hummingbird as well. And this allows me to easily uh, communicate, uh, set up the dev server easily uh, for, for, the, um, for a developer. So there's a different suites depending on what you're doing. If you want to stay with Ngrok, you could do that. If you're using Vapor, you could do that. Or you can use um, sublimation service if you want to use a lifecycle service as well. Let's take a look specifically at how the communication between the heart rate and the browser works using WebSockets. And we built this on top of Redis. So the way this works is that uh, we have a struct setup or a class, or actually, no, excuse me, we have an actor setup. And this has a list of WebSockets based on an ID. And whenever we want to, whenever we get the heart rate from a post call, we go ahead and publish that to Redis. And then at the other end, every time, went back. Every time the uh, Redis says that there's a new heart rate, and then goes in and looks at that dictionary with the array of WebSockets, and it posts, sends that text that's JSON over to the WebSocket. And then the main part here is this. Uh, Giannis, who's here, he helped me a lot with this part. What we do is we subscribe to Redis for any, any new subscription that comes or anything that comes in through Redis. And we go ahead and we create a message out of that. And that will have the information about what WebSocket it goes, or what sets of WebSockets it goes to. And then every time a new message comes into the async stream, it, then it goes ahead and it calls that send text that we saw previously and sends that to the WebSocket. Then there's uh, push notifications. You probably saw that earlier. So every time a new device comes in, we set, up, um, we set it up so that you receive a push notification if you, the instructor, has started a new class. And what we've done is we have a polyfill. So we do have an iPhone app and an Apple Watch app. And um, we have a polyfill that works with both. And then we set up a did register for no remote notifications for both the phone and the watch. Once that is called, we go ahead and call this method here, where we do the thing on the watch where we ask if it's okay to give you notifications, and then we create what's called a uh, mobile device request content. And this creates the information that is then sa saved to the database. Before we do that, we check if the device already has an ID or device token that came from push notifications. And then we go ahead, and if it's already there, we do a modify if we, um, already have one and they did not want notifications, we remove it from the database. And then if they don't want to have one in the database, but they do have, um, they do allow notifications, we go ahead and create that and add that to the table. So once we have that, um, we go ahead and um, create, uh, this is where we save it using uh, Fluent. And then what we've done now is every time a new workout class is started, we're using the middleware, model middleware that comes with Fluent and Vapor to go ahead. And every time a new workout is started, we go ahead and we call that push notification. We create what's called a workout group response, having all the necessary info that we need for the push notification. And then we use Vapor APNS to go ahead and send that out. Um, on the client side, the, we did have to end up creating an iPhone app as much as I didn't want to because it was so important for us to have um, a, you know, actual people being able to download the app easily. And we found that doing that through the Watch App Store wasn't as easy. So we ended up creating an iPhone app. And this, of course, uses everybody's favorite framework, Watch Connectivity. Um, but that has, that has its own layer of issues. So what we ended up doing is I created a combined base library to then listen to different messages and decode them through watch connectivity. Uh, here's a really poor GIF of me doing communicating colors through the Apple Watch. This is a library called Sundial, okay, um, which uses that. Now we're gonna get outside the comfort zone. So hold on folks, this is gonna get really tough. So let's talk about non-Swift stuff. Um, so we do have a web front end. It uses Webpack, Vite, Vue.js, and TypeScript, which I actually 
TypeScript is so much better than, than JavaScript, I have to admit. Um, and I like it for a lot of reasons. I don't prefer it over Swift, but it is pretty darn good for what it does and checking things out. <coughs> the thing with Vue.js is I'm running a Vue.js router, and I want to make sure that every page is still goes through HTML.index because HTML.index has all the code needed for doing the Vue.js routing. So I've set up a couple of middle, middleware pieces in the router that, first of all, the directory index middleware, which checks if the file exists. And then if it does, it goes, goes ahead and serves that particular file, like an image um, or any assets. If it doesn't, it then goes to the index serving middleware. And what I do is I set up um, a specific path for my API. If it matches any of the API paths, then it goes ahead and it runs whatever API I have set up. If it doesn't, then it goes ahead and it serves the uh, cache HTML.index page, assuming that the Vue.js router will then take care of it. So one of the other issues that we ran into was like Swift.pack or package.swift files were just getting massive with all the dependencies we were running, everything else. So I had one of the developers on my team look at it and um, see if he can organize it. This is uh, Ben. And uh, he did this. And I was like, wait, that's really cool. I like this. This is well organized, easy to understand. And it works with Swift packages. But then I thought to myself, why don't I do something like this, but like Swift UI? And so that's where I ran, I reduced it all the way down to this. Um, we have two entries for our products for the stuff that runs on the watch, and then the actual command that gets built. And then we have some test targets. We say we only want to support stuff from 2023. And we have the default localization. And this looks nice, this looks neat. It works out well. Um, of course, the secret behind it is that behind all this, uh, there's all this code that gets generated that you don't see. But it's a lot easier to manage. Um, and so I created this DSL for Swift packages to make me do this. And when the way it works is you just basically, you create all these little structs for each product or test target. And there's some stuff with Swift settings. And then I, um, all I need to do is run a script to do this. So package DSL, all it contains really is the package.sh, which is a bash script that does this fancy code here. Wow, cat, pretty amazing, right? <laughs> and, and it works. It, like all I have to do is just concatenate. You don't need to install anything. It just builds the package.swift file so it's easy to use. Um, well, I never touch the package.swift file, but I do create the files that are needed for, for the different, um, for the Swift package. And then there's these support files set up for things like products and targets that you bring in and it all gets catenated in one file. Um, this is an example of that, how to create a package. And you can see this is a bunch of code that takes the, all the, the um, pro, uh, excuse me, result builders and turns it into a usable Swift package. Um, I've actually modified this script quite a bit and added stuff like, um, like, like you can specify what Swift tools version, it'll minify it, all sorts of stuff that I've been using now on my larger projects. So um, this is the uncomfortable part. We do have an Android app, sorry. Uh, my Android developer was actually like, yeah, Swift on the server has been amazing. It's worked really well. Uh, we really love it. Um, the only issue I've run into, honestly, is Google, like the Google Wear stuff is not as nice as Apple Watch, if you can't believe that. And, um, but otherwise, he's had nothing but everything's been great. Um, we, had, we added login with Google. So we just use the Google Auth stuff that um, they provide from J for JWT. And we also use, uh, we have a setup for um, Fire, we use Firebase notifications to do notifications for Android. Um, and we have a way of checking that in our database and that's worked fantastic. Secondly, we have worked with a client who wants our watch app on the React Native app. That has a whole set of issues, but we do have it working. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And then lastly, we have a Chrome extension, 
which will, what it'll end up doing is you can uh, start, you can watch a YouTube video of a workout and then you can start a workout for yourself. So that way you can, um, and that gives you the push notification on your watch. You go ahead and start the workout on the watch and then the Chrome extension will then show your uh, zones and heart rate and all that information on top of your YouTube video. Um, time. Can I have a little bit more time? I can go over, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, at first, we set up GitLab. Uh, <laughs> this is our repo setup for GitLab. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, and then this is how the CI was set up. Uh, and then we realized GitLab costs a lot of money. And so... And it was just like, if I did the wrong thing, it would just collapse, right? So we had to keep doing it. So um, we switch over to GitHub and that's, that's which GitHub is better. I mean, it is a little bit, it is a bit better, but the cost was better and it gave me an opportunity to really clean this up. So as far as setup for the CI, we have a thing that's built to Ubuntu. So just to make sure the Swift package builds on Ubuntu. Then we build the web front end, so that's like the Tailwind, CSS, JavaScript, all that stuff, TypeScript, excuse me. If that all works, that runs in parallel, then I kick that off and I build it on my Mac OS machine to see if that works, in terms of the iPhone and watch app work. If that works, then we go ahead and lint it and make sure that all our code styling is consistent. And then uh, once that's done, we use Fastlane uh, to archive and deliver the app, depending on what branch it might deliver to test flight. And it just at least ensures that the app still builds and we don't have any weirdness. And what's really nice is that Heroku then has automatic hookup if the CI passes and depending on what branch, it will then deploy that either to our alpha instance or our production instance. And that's worked out really well. Um, as far as getting this working on uh, Heroku, uh, one of the things that we also did is we put everything from being multiple repos to basically going mono repo, and that's been really great. And so the root of our repo is just containing an Xcode gen YAML file, which creates the Xcode project and the fast lane configuration. So that's specifically for the archiving and delivering. And then inside, we'll have a directory for our Swift package, and that contains the code that's necessary to run Vapor, and that uses the Vapor build pack. And then we also have the web folder, which creates the web front end, and that uses the Node.js build pack. And then because of the structure of our directory or our repo, we had to add a what's called a subdirectory uh, build pack because our Swift, <coughs> excuse me, the Swift code and the web directory were all in not in the root. So we had to we had to have a way to notify that using that build pack. So here's a video just demoing GB. It's one of our ads. Uh, it does have sound. We can kind of get the idea of how it works, personal coaching through data, web interface, um, and we have gyms that we're partnering up with this year that is going to continue to grow this app. Um, lastly, now it's time to cool down. No more talk about Android and React. Well, there's a little bit of talk about React, sorry. The first thing I want to do uh, is when we built the app, uh, Giannis was super helpful. Um, we, we needed op an open API um, spec for it. And uh, there was no way to do this. So what we did is we used Matt, Matt Polzin's library to create an open API specs from our code. And uh, it's not great um, because uh, it, creates, it just creates all these wrappers that is kind of confusing and kind of a mess to deal with. Um, so in the future, obviously, I think we want to we want to switch that over and use the new uh, Swift Open API generator um, now that that's available. As far as React Native, we have uh, an issue where we essentially have to share the code with the client, and I hate that uh, for a lot of reasons. Not so much security as much as like they can mess with it. Um, and so what we'd like to do is figure out a way to build an XC framework we can deliver to them. There are some issues with dependencies and server-side Swift all being in the same package that kind of causes this issue. So that's definitely something we want to do. I want to research protobuf. I want to 
maybe switch over the heart rate stuff and the health stats over to protobuf instead of json and maybe even some of the watch connectivity stuff would be great protobuf you can set it up that um you basically create like a protobuf file and it'll generate a swift um struct for you out of that kind of similar to how the open open api stuff works lastly there's all sorts of weird quirks with networking on the apple watch i don't know if anybody knows this but there's limitations that aren't obvious when you start running this. For instance, with the Bonjour stuff, we ran into all sorts of issues where you can send data through Bonjour. Um, and so that's why I ended up using the text record. But you run into like WebSockets don't work on the watch, but even though the API is there, et cetera. So that's something I want to research more, maybe look into long pooling, things like that. Um, if you're interested, you can check uh, gb.com was the app and then heart twitch i'm in the middle of rebranding and changing the name because i'm not interested in which spells which apparently is what people who tag heart twitch on reddit are interested in so uh i'm going to be renaming it bitness this is kind of a prototype icon you can actually go there right now and sign up if you're interested in trying that out gb you can sign up right now and use it uh here's a list of the repositories that i mentioned um and then that will be in the slides. And you can also check out the notes from my talk that I'm still working on, but you can at least look at it and see it once I push. Thank you, that's it.